All right, welcome to Wednesday. Um, I wanted to point out a couple of things from this week's announcement. One, since Monday is Memorial Day, I've moved that module 14 review to next Tuesday. So you guys will have an extra day for that. And also, I wanted to just draw attention to the slow assessment. And these are assessments of the student learning objectives. That's what slow stands for. You guys ought to be doing these in pretty much every single class now, every semester. And it's just a really tiny assessment. Um, there's only one question for each quiz in there. So there are quizzes in this slow assessment shell. So if you guys just go to your dashboard, you might have to scroll down a bit, but you ought to see the Math 140 slow assessment canvas shell. And if you click on that, there are instructions, but I mean, you really just, you know, move through to take the quizzes. And it is password protected, so you'll enter the access code is the same as the number of our course. So you'll just enter 140 for each one of those quizzes. Okay, so if you guys could do those as soon as possible, this does not go toward your grade, but it's just part of the academic process. It keeps us accredited as a college. And it's just important for, um, you know, the, the college to analyze student progress and student success and student learning. And these get mapped to program slows and uh, the whole college slows and everything. So if you guys could please do that, that would be great. All right, and then we're moving on with logs. So last time we left off with this topic, I do believe, where we're solving an exponential equation using natural logs. And so what we wanna do is take the natural log of both sides, right? We're solving for y, which is up in the exponent. So to bring that down, we know we can use the power rule of logs. So we can take the natural log of both sides. And now we can use that power rule and bring the entire exponent down in front of the natural log here. And then note that the natural log of E equals one. And that's because the base of natural log we know is E, even though we don't write the base E, we know the base is E. <clears throat> and if you think about that triangle, the base E to the one power equals E. Right, E to the first power equals the argument. So natural log of E equals one. So that gives us just negative eight Y equals natural log of nine. And then to solve for Y, just divide both sides by negative eight. And pull up your trusty calculator as they ask you to round to the nearest hundredth. Hmm. 
So natural log of nine divided by negative eight. So it's negative 0.274. We're rounding to the nearest hundredth. That's where the seven is. <clears throat> so our answer, it's approximately negative 0.27. Okay. And let us take a look at the Alex explanation. They also take the natural log of both sides, bring down the exponent using that power property. Natural log of E equals one. So they go through this explanation again. Right, e to the first power equals E. Divide both sides by negative eight and do that on the calculator. Okay, so anytime we see a variable up in the exponent that we're trying to solve for, take the log of both sides. And again, my general rule is I use common log unless I see an E. So here we purposely took the natural log because that made things a lot easier because the natural log of E is one. Okay, so try one of these. Uh, let me get another one, sorry. I think that was the same one. Yeah, try that one. Right, so you take the natural log of both sides, bring the power six X down, natural log of E is one, and then you can divide both sides by six. And do that on your calculator and round up to the nearest hundredth, which is 0.4. You know, I also just wanted to point out here that it is possible to put this in log form. You know, this is given to you in exponential form. And so the base is E, so that means we have natural log or log base E. Remember the log equals the exponent. And this is the argument, which is this line right here. 
And then you could just solve for X by dividing both sides by six. Right, et cetera, et cetera. But I have to say that this is the more customary way to do it down here, to take the natural log of both sides. And Alex also points out that you could still take the common log of both sides, but it's easier to use the natural log because of the key, which is what I've been saying too. Okay, are you guys good with this one? Okay, so for the last problem, we were estimating and rounding our answers using a calculator. This topic is asking for exact answers. So again, we're asked to solve for x, and x is up in the exponents. So we need to take the log of both sides to bring the powers down using the power property. Well, it says you can either use base 10 or base E, the natural log. Again, I just tend to use um, the common log unless there's an E and you're kind of sitting around wondering what to do. So take the log of both sides. And then use the power property and bring the power down in front. And so that power multiplies the entire, you know, the entire power multiplies the log 17. All right, you need to put that in parentheses because it's not just the five multiplying log 17. It's the negative x plus five, that whole thing. Okay, so we're trying to solve for x. So I'm going to go ahead and distribute on the left. We get negative x log 17 plus 5 log 17. And I want the terms with the x all on one side so I can factor the x out. So I'm going to add 10x log 9 to both sides. 10x log 9. And I'm going to keep this term because it also has an x on the left and subtract five log 17 from both sides. Now I'm gonna factor out the X on the left. So I have 10 times log 9 minus log 17 
equals negative five log 17. <laughs> And to solve for x, divide both sides by the stuff in parentheses. Okay, so since this is common log, we could approximate this on the calculator, but this question is asking for the exact answer. So this is the exact answer for x. And there are lots of different ways we could write this. Um, I'm sure Alex will give us multiple ways you can see here, trying to make it so you can kind of see both. Oops. <clears throat> uh, they put the negative log 17 first and the 10 log 9 on the right. But it doesn't matter what order we add two things. So that's equivalent. They also show how you could get the same answer with a natural log. Um, yeah. Okay. So again, notice we just took the log of both sides, brought the powers down. And keep in mind, like log 17, it's just a number. Log nine, it's just a number. You know, you could approximate those on a calculator. Like, log 17, is approximately 1.23, right? So imagine if you had 1.23 there, you would go through the same exact steps. You distribute, get the terms with the X on one side, factor the X out. Okay. So go ahead and try this one.
Okay, take the log of both sides, bring the power down, distribute, factor out the X and divide both sides by the bottom. And it'd be the same thing if we took the natural log of both sides. What do you guys think? Okay. You bet. Maybe another one of these, just to be sure. I feel like we did one with 17. <laughs> All right, how about this one? And I'll just pull up the answer if you want to look or check a step. Is this one okay? All right. All right, so these were 
uh, problems <clears throat> for exponential growth or decay. So remember we started out, they might have a picture, no. We started out when we were looking at exponentials. Let me just draw a couple of quick graphs here. You know, we saw that an exponential function <clears throat> either grows really quickly or it decays. So looking from left to right, you know, it either grows or it decays. And this is true when we have a continuous exponential function. It's either gonna grow or it's gonna decay. <clears throat> um, the general formula is A equals P times E to the RT. Maybe I'll write that over here as well. And so normally we think of P, if we're talking about money that's growing exponentially as the principal. So that's why we use that P, but it's the initial amount or the amount at time zero, right? So P is the initial amount. So the initial amount of bacteria, the initial amount of money, the initial amount of mass, and then R, is um, a rate parameter. So it's basically like how much is going to, how quickly <clears throat> something is going to grow or decay. When something's growing, R is positive and it increases the amount increases over time. And if R is negative, it decreases. So hopefully that just is very intuitive. But when it's positive, you get growth. And when it's negative, you get decay. So basically, we're just going to be kind of sticking things into this formula. A is the amount at time t. So A is a function of time, and usually we know what that rate parameter is. So looking at this problem, suppose that the number of bacteria in a certain population increases according to a continuous exponential growth model with a growth rate parameter of 30% per hour. Suppose also that a sample culture of 2,900 bacteria is obtained from this population. So that's that initial amount there, 2,900. Find the size of the sample after five hours. And so again, that, R is the, is the rate parameter. So the actual growth is not 30% each hour. Um, it's kind of close to that, but technically it's a growth rate parameter. So it's growing. We know R is positive and R is 30%, which is 0.3, right? Remember, <clears throat> that percent 
It literally means per 100. So that means 30 hundredths, right? That's the hundredths place. Thirty hundredths, and you don't need to say like three dimes and zero cents. You can just say three dimes. You can chop off any zeros. So, thirty hundredths is the same as three tenths, right? Three tenths. So again, we're just plopping these numbers into this formula. It starts at 2,900, the growth rate parameter is 30%, and we want to know how many bacteria are there after five hours. So that's the time. And that's a nice easy uh, calculation up in the exponent. 0.3 times 5 is 1.5, and then you can do this calculation on your calculator. So 2,900 times E. So notice I press the second key to get the E to the X. And I'm going to put 1.5 up in the exponent. And there we go. <clears throat> and we're asked to round to the nearest integer. So remember, integers are those nice roundish numbers kind of like whole numbers, but it includes the negatives. So 12,996 and close to another one. So we round that up to seven. Okay, so integers are the numbers like Negative three, negative two, negative one, zero, one, two, three, etc. Okay. They're the roundish numbers <clears throat> with no additional decimal or fractional parts. Another growth one. Let me just pull up a decay. It's a money problem, but I kind of want to pull up a decay problem. Here we go. This follows a continuous exponential decay model. So now we know that growth rate parameter, it's going to be negative. And 8% is 0 0.08. Okay, so we start with 2.14 kilograms. It's going to keep decaying, and we want to know how much after five days. So we're solving for A, that principal amount is 2.14. The decay rate parameter is 8%. Since it's decaying, you're going to make it negative. And you want to know how much after five days. OK, so 5 times 8 cents is 40 cents. So you get a negative 0.4 up there. And you can just do this on a calculator. 2.14 times e to the negative 
So there's 1.43, and we're rounding to two decimal places. So 1.43. So it makes sense that it's going to be less, right? You start out at 2.14 kilograms. After it decays, you want there to be less and approximately 1.43. Okay. So they just do the same exact thing. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so now for one of these money problems. Again, same thing. When the interest is compounded continuously, we use the same exact formula as opposed to compounded like quarterly or annually or monthly or whatever. When something changes continuously, we always end up with this formula. Okay, so an initial amount of money is placed into an account. The interest rate is 1% per year, compounded continuously. So that's the rate. And then after three years, so that means that T equals three. This is the total amount in the account. So that's A. And you're asked to find the initial amount. So you're trying to find P here. So we put everything in. 25, 96, 75 is A. This is the formula. We're trying to solve for P. We know the rate is 0 0.01 and T is three. So I can multiply up in the exponent. And to solve for P, we just divide both sides by E to the 0 0.03, because that's just a number. Right, divide both sides by that. Solve for P. So this is an exact answer, but we're asked to round to the nearest cent. So we're gonna do that on a calculator. Twenty five, ninety six, seventy five divided by E to the point O three. So the principal amount was twenty five thousand twenty and zero cents. And again, it makes sense that the amount it ended up at is more than the amount it started at, 
because it's earning interest. <clears throat> it's just a tiny bit, <laughs> right? That's not even outbeating inflation there. Okay. So they do the same thing, just showing how you substitute in and do that on a calculator and round. And they remind you here when the interest is not continuously compounded, we use that formula, which we've said before. So annually, semi-annually, quarterly, monthly, weekly. And notice the more frequently the interest is compounded, the more money that is accumulated, just a tiny bit. But look, here you have 36 cents, here you have 55 cents. 65 cents, 71 cents, 74 cents. And when it was compounded continuously, you had 75 cents. So continuously compounded interest grows faster than if you compound it even every week, which makes sense because you're not doing it every year or every quarter or every month or every week. You're doing it more frequently not even every day or every second, but literally continuously, every moment. So guess what, you guys? This is how credit card companies charge you interest. They compound the interest continuously. And that's why you get an APR instead of, you know, the actual rate. Because once you've calculated how much, you know, you owe at the end of like a month or at the end of a year, <clears throat> you've had to put it into this formula. So if you started out owing like $2,000 and the interest rate on your credit card was like 5% per year, it's compounded continuously though. So you would have to put it in this formula and you're gonna owe more than 5%, which would be simple interest on the $2,000. <laughs> right, I know. All right, so go ahead and try one of these. How do you do a few of these? I'll pull up the explanation here and the solution. <clears throat> so this is exponential growth and the rate is positive. The 
Is this one okay? Or am I going too fast? Are you good too, Laura? Okay. And here's a decay. Here you go. Is this one good with you too, Laura? Okay. We try to find a money problem. Here we go.
<laughs> yeah, so here <clears throat> you're asked to find the initial amount. So you're solving for P. <laughs> <clears throat> My guess is you put that for P. <clears throat> yep. All right, how, how about this one? Now, are you solving for A or P? This question actually asks, find the amount after five years. So not the initial amount, but the amount after five years. Right, so he, in this problem, you wanna solve for A. How about that one? How about you, Adrian? Okay. Okay, are you solving for A or P on this one? Yep. <clears throat> now you want to find the initial amount, so that's P. Okay. So this is probably a good time to take a break. So let's break here and we'll come back at 10.15.
All right. So that topic was finding the initial or final amount of a word problem. Now we're going to be finding the rate or time. All right. So we still have this continuous exponential, in this case, decay model. And the decay rate parameter is 8.9% per day. Find the half-life of the substance. That is the time it takes for one half the original amount <clears throat> of the substance to decay. All right, so we're still making use of this formula for continuous growth or decay. Since it's decay, we know that the rate is gonna be negative. Negative. 8.9%. And we're trying to find the half-life or the time. So we're trying to find T, right? We're solving for T. And we're looking for the time that some amount decays to half of what it was. So if you had some amount A, oops, if you had some amount P, after a certain amount of time, you're gonna have one half of P. Does that make sense? You start with some amount P and then it's gonna decay. And at the end, you have one half of P left. Does that make sense? There's one yes. All right, and then we can divide both sides by P because they both have a P in them. So now we're left with this. And hey, we already know how to solve for a variable up in an exponent. Since there's an E, it's going to be easier for us to take the natural log of both sides. Because then we can use the power property to bring the power down. So bring this power down in front. And the natural log of E is one. And, and one times anything is just that anything there. I'll copy this again on the left. And so now to solve for t, just divide both sides by that decimal. I'm just going to write the t on the left. Right, you're dividing both sides by the decimal. And you can do that on a calculator.
So the natural log of a half, which is 0.5, divided by negative 0 0.089. And we're being asked to round to the nearest hundredth. So it's going to be 7.79 days. OK. So again, we're just plugging things in, but now since we're solving for either rate or time, like it says up here, we're gonna end up taking either the log or the common log, uh, common log or natural log of both sides. So we can use the power property and bring the power down. Is this making sense? Let's see what Alex has to say. So they set it up the same way. They put P over two instead of one half times P, but that's the same exact thing. And they end up taking the natural log of both sides, et cetera. So let's see what kind of other problems are in here. All right, so this is a growth model. The number of bacteria of a certain population increases according to a continuous exponential growth model with a growth parameter of 7.1%. Now it's asking you, how many hours does it take for the sample to double? How many hours? So that means you're solving for T. Oops, not two, but solve for T. So here's the formula. So we know it's growth. So that's gonna be a positive Point oh seven one, and we're solving for T. So notice I'm just filling in what I have to begin with, right? E is just a number. That's not a variable that you're substituting in for. E is just always E, just like pi is always pi. <clears throat> but you're given a number for the rate, and then we're being asked to solve for T. And we wanna know how many hours it takes for the size of the sample to double. So if you start with P, when you double it, the amount that you have is two times P. Does that make sense there? It's because we want the sample initial sample to double. And again, divide both sides by P. Take the natural log of both sides and bring the power down on the right. Natural log of E is one. One times anything is one, is whatever you started with. 
And then you can divide both sides by the decimal. So that cancels and you just have T on one side and the natural log of two over that decimal on the other side. Which you can solve for on a calculator. Natural log two, oops. divided by 0 0.071. And to the nearest hundredth, 9.76. And we're talking about hours. Okay. All right, so try this one. Okay, so again, um, <clears throat> this is a decay model. So this rate parameter is going to be negative. We're solving for time. We're solving for T. And we want to find the, the time it takes for half of the initial amount to decay. So if you start with P, you end up with one half P. And then divide both sides by P. Take the natural log of both sides, bring the power down and divide both sides by the decimal.
Okay. This is just pointing out that that P does disappear. It doesn't matter how much mass you have. Half-life always works the same. You're going to have half of whatever you started with. Is that OK? You're good, Adrian, too. Let's just see if there are any other types of problems in here. That's similar with doubling. Uh, let's see one where you solve for a rate. Okay, try this one. You're asked to find the hourly growth rate parameter. Is this one okay?
Okay. So that's all we got on logs and exponentials. <clears throat> Next up, we're talking about conic sections. Just want to make sure we've already graphed some parabolas. Okay. <clears throat> so first, I just want to pull up. Um, yeah, picture. I used to always have to try to draw this. But looking over here, um, this shape is called a cone in mathematics. It looks like an ice cream cone that's upside down. <clears throat> and if you take a cone, and you slice it with a plane, right? Think of a plane as like a, just a sheet of paper. So you have like your ice cream cone upside down here, and you're gonna take that plane and slice it. If you slice it evenly, like perpendicular to an axis going right through the middle, then the shape that's created around the edges of that cone is a circle. And if you take the paper and slice it at an angle, then the shape that's created is called an ellipse. And notice if you go, you know, straight down to the bottom there, the shape that's created is a parabola. And even though this shape doesn't show it maybe as nicely as this one, like technically a cone in math has that top piece also, right? And if you slice straight down parallel to a vertical axis going right through the center, <clears throat> then see the yellow marks. That shape is called a hyperbola. Okay. <clears throat> so you have the parabola, a circle, an ellipse, and a hyperbola. So since all of these are created using a cone, they're called conic sections. And again, we've already graphed parabolas and, you know, played around with quadratics. <clears throat> so now we're going to learn about circles, ellipses, and hyperbolas. Starting with circles. Okay, so just like we saw with linear equations, circles have an equation form that's called standard form. And the standard form for a circle is like this. And I'm just leaving some blanks because I want to use a different color. I should use a different color there too. I will. Okay, so R is the radius of the circle. And HK is the center of the circle. And that is the X and the Y coordinate of the point that's at the center. Okay, so if I were to graph, what does this look like on there? Let's just 
explain. Okay. So if I were to graph the circle somewhere, basically I would pick some point that's the center and then go out a certain radius, some distance, let me make it prettier. So that length is called R. And then, you know, basically all of the points that are R units away from the center, it's really hard to draw a circle. <laughs> <clears throat> These are all of the points that make up the circle. Oh, I forget, there's actually um, a circle tool. Let me try to use it. Okay. That looks better. How about that? <laughs> so all of those points are points X, Y that make up the circle. Just like when you graph a line, all of the X, Ys on that line make up the line. Okay, so this equation gives you the relationship for all of the points that work. And that's called the standard form equation. And so this problem says to graph the circle given its equation in standard form. So since it's in standard form, we can just read off, right? The center is the point three, one. And the radius is two, because I could write that four as two squared. Okay, so I'm sure there's a circle tool for you to graph in Alex, but by hand, you know, you'd go out three and up one and put your center right there. And then I would say, since the radius is two, you know, go up two, go down two, go left two, and right two, and then draw your circle you know, kind of making use of those four points. So going up, down, left, and right by hand is really handy, no pun intended. <laughs> okay. So they show the same thing. They even show how to derive that formula. Just not very difficult. Um, so you have the center HK and the radius is the distance from the center to any point on the graph of the circle. So it goes out to any random point XY. And then you can use the distance formula where the distance between those two points is written like that. And then you can square both sides and you get the standard form of a circle.
So again, notice the H and K are three, one, and the radius is two. So you plot the center and I'm not sure exactly how that circle graphing tool works. I think you do graph the center first and then pull it out the radius using the circle tool and it fills it in. Kind of like how I did that one. So, you know, kind of like you do that and pull it out. But this, this tool that I'm using is a little different. Okay, so this one, Right, the H is zero, the K is four, and the radius is two. See what I'm saying there? If you just have X squared, that's the same as X minus zero squared. So that's the center. So zero, four is the center. And you could go left, right, up and down two by hand and sketch it in. I probably should have left part of that. Okay, so try one of these. So notice here, since that's a plus five, <clears throat> you have to put a negative five in here because X minus negative five gives you X plus five. And here you would put a zero. And I don't know why the radii are all two. Radii is plural for radius, by the way. Radii. I. It's just a coincidence. So the center is negative five, zero, and the radius is two. Negative five, zero, up, down, left, and right, two. Okay. Is this one good? Okay. Okay, 
So now you're asked to graph the circle and you're given the equation in general form instead of standard form. Right? This was standard form over here. So we know how to graph these when they're in standard form. So that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna put this equation into standard form. So let's rearrange the terms on the left and let's group together the terms that have X's in them. And I'm gonna leave just a little bit of space and then I'm gonna group together the terms that have y's in them. And I'm going to leave a little space and I'm going to put the constant on the other side. See, it's starting to look more and more like the standard form. <clears throat> I've got x stuff, I've got y stuff, and then I have a number <clears throat> on the right. And notice in standard form, both the x stuff and the y stuff, those are perfect squares. So hey, if we only had perfect squares on the left over here, but wait, we know how to make perfect squares <laughs> because we've learned how to complete the square. Remember, you take half the coefficient of the x or half the coefficient of the linear term. You take half of that and then square it. So negative 2 quantity squared gives you 4. So I'm going to add 4 here. But if I add four on the left, I have to add four on the right. And really this is a plus y squared. So now we're gonna do the same thing with the y. We're gonna complete the square. So take half the negative six, that's negative three and square it and you get positive nine. So again, if I add nine on the left, I have to add nine on the right. And now I'm gonna rewrite the left-hand side <clears throat> where these are the perfect squares. Right, this first one, it's x minus 2 quantity squared. And this is y minus 3 quantity squared. And on the right, the 9s cancel, and you're left with 4. So now you've got the center is 2, 3 and the radius is two. And we know how to graph that. Okay, so they go through the same thing. The center is two, three, like I have here in purple, and the radius is two. So you go right two, up three, and then up, down, left, and right to get your circle. Okay, so we group the x stuff, we group the y stuff, complete the square on both x and y, and write it in standard form.
Okay. So again, originally we were kind of learning how to complete the square so we could solve a quadratic equation. But as you can see, there are other uses for completing the square. So go ahead and try this one. Group the X stuff together, the Y stuff together, move the constant on the other side and complete the square on X and Y. So I brought up at least the first part here. So you can see just rearranging the X stuff and the Y stuff and subtracting 17 from both sides. And then you take half the 10, which is five and square it. So you're gonna add 25 to both sides. Tap the two and square it at one to both sides. And then you can write the equation in standard form and graph it. How is that one? All right, and I see it's 11 o'clock already. So let's go ahead and stop here. And I'll see you guys Friday, okay?